Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Al Fournier, uh, who is an associate specialist uh, in entomology at the University of Arizona. And uh, he also serves as associate director of the Arizona Pest Management Center. He actually got his uh, uh, master's degree at University of Maryland, but then came here to Purdue University for his PhD, which we're glad that he, he did. He graduated in 2005. His dissertation may be, in fact, the very longest dissertation in the history of Purdue. Uh, we had him boil it down and boil it down, and uh, he had some really good stuff in there. And we didn't, finally, we got to the point where we didn't know what to do with it. So this is the result. It's a book that uh, was authored by Al, basically his dissertation put it into a book form. That's how we, we published it. So graduate students take note. Um, everybody has heard of uh, integrated pest management in schools, I think, uh, but many people don't know that it actually started uh, for the most part here in Indiana and Al was a big part of that. That's what his dissertation was, uh, was about. It's about the uh, adoption and in implementation of uh, IPM in schools. Um, he has since spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, the measurements of impact and uh, uh, how to uh, report those, especially in, in, in things like uh, grants, which is very important in order to get grants published. So. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, from Al about those kinds of things. I think he's going to touch on those in, in his seminar. Just on a personal note, um, Al was very productive here outside of the, the laboratory. Uh, I'll just say that uh, he met his wife here and they got married. And uh, I hope he uh, adds a little bit more detail to that because it's an interesting story. I just learned uh, from Al that he has also gotten into poetry. And it seems like every really, really good writer will eventually circle back to poetry. And Al told me that he does a little of that and actually uh, teaches some workshops. And I wanted to brag a little bit because, you know, being at home, I made a, uh, a homemade uh, Valentine's poem. It started off really strong. Roses are red, violets are blue. And then it went kind of downhill. I couldn't think of any appropriate word to rhyme with blue. So I'm going to leave that all up to, to Al. Uh, Al, uh, I have asked uh, uh, you to sort of stick around for a little bit longer than the seminar after we close at uh, 1130. If uh, people have uh, uh, questions and you want to get down in the weeds a little bit, about what Al actually can recommend in terms of some of the things that he has done and his successes. So we'll stay on the line if anybody wants to stay and join us, uh, go for a few minutes longer than 1130, but we will uh, close right at 1130. So with that, Al, thanks again for uh, joining us. We look forward to what you have to say and I'm going to turn the time right over to you. Thanks, Tim. Um, appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we'll get started with the presentation. Um, thank you for that introduction, Tim. I'm really, really thrilled to be here. I had a great time at Purdue and it was a really uh, good time in my life uh, and uh, really learned a lot. I worked with uh, Tim Gibb and Chris Aceto. I want to thank you all for the invitation and uh, thank everyone in the entomology department for putting this together. Uh, Thanks, Kaylee, for reaching out to me uh, for the graduate students, and I really look forward to meeting with all of you a little bit later after this. Um, so I'm at University of Arizona. As you know, I uh, graduated Purdue in 2005 and uh, began my, my program in, ent uh, in entomology here, really with a focus on uh, evaluating IPM, which was the focus of my PhD work, as Tim mentioned. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my program. Uh, first, I want to, uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, here's a little shot from history. Uh, this is me 
with my now wife, uh, Shu Jen Li, and we both work for University of Arizona. She graduated in 2007 and uh, followed me here. And uh, now we both work in cooperative extension and uh, had a great time at Purdue. Uh, my wife now um, has her own program in public health IPM and she seriously, she seriously kicks some butt. That picture of her down at the bottom is uh, from the Rodent Academy uh, in 2019. Um, and yeah, they're actually holding rodents in that shot. <laughs> well, cadavers of rodents in that shot. Um, our daughter Deanna was born in 2011. Uh, so there's some photos of her when she was young. Arizona is a different place. And I thought I would start by just giving a little quick introduction to uh, Arizona. And uh, we're based out of the Maricopa Agricultural Center, which is about 100 miles north of the Tucson U of A campus. We, uh, we live on the south edge of Phoenix uh, and commute into Maricopa uh, currently. Uh, I'm also highlighting the Grand Canyon, which if you've been to Arizona, hopefully you've been up there. Um, this area down here is really where most of the population is found. And believe it or not, we call, we call Phoenix Central Arizona. And the Ag Center is located in a place that makes, uh, makes it possible for us to do outreach and extension really throughout where most of the population is in the state. If you think of Arizona, you might think of something like this. And we have a lot of uh, wild and natural lands in Arizona that look very beautiful. Um, you're not mistaken. But we also have very large populations. Uh, there's 4.5 million people in Maricopa County which is the county that Phoenix is in and the surrounding uh, area. We've got about 7.2 million in the entire state. So urban pest management is really an important uh, field here as well. And at the, at the University of Arizona, we have our Arizona Pest Management Center that deals with uh, IPM across agriculture as well as urban environments. We also have a lot of natural lands. My wife does a lot of, uh, a lot of work with indigenous peoples uh, and the border tribes where they have um, quite serious uh, and, and difficult issues to deal with. You may not know that we have lots and lots of agriculture in Arizona, a very productive state. It's all irrigated agriculture and uh, we grow a diversity of crops. A lot of, a lot of the vegetable crops are grown in Yuma uh, around the southwestern border of the state. It's right there next to California and Mexico. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that lettuce production. I'll be talking about a, a project we did in lettuce. I've organized my talk around my, my, basically my extension program and my goals. My appointment is 10% research and 90% uh, extension. So we do a lot of work with stakeholders out in the public. Um, these are burrowing owls. We have burrowing owls that we can see all around the farm uh, at the uh, at the Maricopa Agricultural Center. They nest in little holes around the edge of the fields and uh, they offer some, some free pest control, really cute. <laughs> so the goals of my program are to improve the measurement of IPM outcomes. And that means that one of my first charges as I started here was to develop resources that would help us to, to measure some of those outcomes. And I'll talk about those. Uh, the second goal is then to communicate those outcomes uh, in impact statements, uh, to talk about why integrated pest management is important to uh, the economy and to human health and the environment. And a third and more recent goal uh, is to kind of hone in on risks that are associated with pest management practices and pesticides in particular uh, through our extension education program and to find ways to reduce risks even further uh, in our programs. And so this has been a little bit of an evolution that I wanna take you through uh, in this talk. So I'll start by talking about documenting impacts. And uh, as Tim mentioned uh, a moment ago, this is important for a lot of reasons, but if you're in academia, no matter, no matter your field these days, whether you're doing NIH grants or whether you're doing USDA grants or EPA grants, your, your money's coming from somewhere and federal dollars basically come from tax money and you need to be able to document that um, your project is having an impact you know, on people, that it's, it's implementing some kind of a change. And so uh, being able to document impacts is really important for that reason. Um, it's also important to your success as a faculty member if you wanna kind of climb the ladder and 
and get tenure and all that good stuff. So I want to tell you about two really, really important data resources that, uh, that we use in Arizona that I, I helped to develop here um, in order to document some of the impacts of our agricultural integrated pest management programs. So the first is uh, a pesticide use database. And uh, I should explain that Arizona is one of only two states in the country that requires uh, growers to submit basically real-time information. They have about a week after an application to submit the information to the Department of Agriculture here. Um, California is the other state. California has 100% use reporting in their crops. And so you can find very good information online about everything that's sprayed on all the crops in California. In Arizona, we don't have 100% use reporting, but many of the applications, most of, uh, the, um, most of the insecticide applications, in fact, are applied by custom applicators, the companies that are hired by the grower to do the work. And all custom applications require reporting. So we have not perfect, but very good reporting on our pesticide use. I've coordinated with the Arizona Department of Agriculture to capture that data. I have people that work with me in my lab to uh, verify and evaluate and correct the information uh, to make it as, you know, as good and solid as possible. And then we use that information in a lot of ways. We use it to teach, we use it to uh, write grants, we use it to evaluate the outcomes of our programs. A second resource that's pretty important, and this one predates me a little bit, is the uh, crop pest losses surveys. And when you think of the survey, you think, you know, there's a few questions there that you answer, but this is a very, very intensive survey that goes out to the pest managers themselves. We have licensed pest control advisors that work with the growers that are experts in uh, weeds, uh, diseases, and insect management, and they advise the growers. And so that's really our target audience for this. We work directly with the people making the applications and the decisions for pest management. We do intensive trainings and then we, we really grill them on their practices each year. We only do this in a couple of crops, um, some of the more important crops in Arizona. Currently we're doing it in lettuce and cotton. Uh, we previously had uh, discontinued, we were doing regular surveys in melons, but it's a pretty intensive process. Um, I wanna share with you uh, to start a little bit of data that comes out of this. You do this every year, you can generate really a story of a crop, a story of an industry and its progress. And this happens to be information from the cotton pest losses survey. Um, as I said, this survey predates me. It came out of uh, something called the, the cotton insect losses survey, which was done in all the cotton states. And Peter Ellsworth, who's our cotton IPM specialist, had already begun to modify this survey when I started in 2005. And, um, and then we refined it further and now we have it, um, you know, we have a computerized online version uh, with lots of data checking and so forth, data verification built into it. So basically this is the kind of story you can tell and I'll just very briefly go through this. We have our, uh, our three key pests shown up here with the color code and the bar charts show the number of sprays. And you can see the points at which new technologies were introduced or new programs were introduced. And you see over time, the reduction in pesticide sprays in cotton. It's really, really a remarkable system um, in cotton here. We have a lot of natural enemies and we also have a lot of, um, currently we have a lot of um, reduced risk selective insecticides that are, that are very effective for those key pests. A couple of the watershed events here, we had the uh, introduction of insect growth regulators and BT cotton right here around 1996. And you see this precipitous drop in sprays a pink bollworm eradication program. You might've seen an article in PNAS that just came out. Bruce Dabashnik uh, is the lead author of an article talking about that success story where we've eliminated pink bollworm uh, in Arizona and a lot of the surrounding region. Um, and um, that's pretty phenomenal feat to actually eradicate a pest. You can see that drop off here in 2006 where new controls were introduced for ligus, a key pest. It's, a, 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 it's in the, um, it's, a, a, it's a seed feeder. And um, um, we um, just see through a series of technological introductions and then the IPM programs and information to promote the adoption going along with it. 
we see basically uh, uh, quite a reduction over time. And just to share with you some of the outcomes in that program, uh, which we only take partial credit for. Some of this is technology and uh, 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 we, we don't always lay claim that this is all because we, you know everything the University of Arizona did, but we were there every step of the way in the research and also in helping growers to implement this in ways that made sense. Um, and we estimate through that survey, cotton pest losses survey, they've saved $600 million uh, from 1996 to 2019. That's savings in sprays not made and also increased yield uh, from fewer pest losses over that time. We've eliminated three, about 35 million pounds of insecticide active ingredient going into the environment. And um, just a couple of numbers from those surveys. In 2018, 86% of all the insecticides used in cotton were fully selective, meaning they didn't harm natural enemies at all, and they helped to maintain, uh, maintain biological control. In 2020, we just finished our survey, and about 21% of the cotton acres were never sprayed for insects. So it's a pretty phenomenal system. Being able to document risk and measure things like that as I said, it's important because you are able to show progress in your programs. You're able to show um, that you have the ability to measure that progress. So um, the main portion of my talk here, I want to cover uh, how we measure pesticide risk. And to start talking about that, I'm gonna introduce a project um, in Arizona lettuce. If you're eating lettuce in the winter, it probably came from Arizona. Arizona produces 95% of the fresh lettuce uh, in, in the United States. And uh, in this last year, well, 2019, uh, our main lettuces were worth about 1.6 billion. Uh, most of this, again, is coming from the Yuma region. We grow all kinds of other vegetables as well that might land in your salad bowl. And, um, one of the important constraints in that lettuce production comes from something called the produce paradox. There was a paper that came out from uh, Dr. John Palumbo and Steve Castle in 2009 in Pest Management Science, where they talk about how consumers wanna have nice, clean, blemish-free lettuce, uh, and yet they wish it to be produced without any pesticides. And also uh, they don't wanna have any bugs in their salad, that's for sure. So this is a very challenging constraint on production. As you can imagine, uh, the, the difficulty of putting food you know, out in the ground and, and not having uh, some insects be attracted to that. But the lettuce industry has made phenomenal progress in this. And this slide, which is uh, from the lettuce pest losses survey, it shows uh, the reduction in broad spectrum insecticide use from 2005 to 2020. Uh, and at the same time, in the green line there, you see an increase in reduced risk insecticides. Um, and these are the selective insecticides that target those key pests and help to uh, actually limit, often limit the, and reduce the number of sprays. So I wanna share with you some data from our pesticide use database related to this. And I'm just gonna point out this inflection point in 2011 here where uh, the reduced risk chemistries uh, surpassed the broad spectrum insecticides. <clears throat> I'm going back in time even farther. So this only goes back to 2005. Now we're back to 1991. And you can see this precipitous drop in the use of broad spectrum insecticides. This is from our pesticide use database again. Um, and this is all broad spectrums combined. So we can break down the numbers for you. Basically a 91% reduction in overall broad spectrum use from this period to this period. And uh, we can look at that here. We're looking at pounds of active ingredient per acre. This is the same data now showing that as the number of sprays in lettuce, 72% reduction in broad spectrums. And then here we introduce the reduced risk chemistries, which came in at around 1995. The insect growth regulators and uh, the neonicotinoids were actually the first uh, that helped to uh, precipitate this drop because of their selectivity. Um, and they began to replace uh, many of those applications that were made previously with broad spectrums. 
uh, that shows a 14 fold increase in the use of reduced risk. And note that this ends at 2011, about that time where the, um, you know, the uh, reduced risks are starting to cross over that line. It's from a different data source, so it doesn't match exactly. So we can show these numbers all day, and we could show similar numbers across some of our different cropping systems, but they raise a question. We know we've reduced pesticide use and particularly broad spectrum use, but have we actually reduced risk and can we document it as a reduction in risk? We always want to just imply that and it certainly seems sensible, but I wanted to get into a project where we might be able to show that. So uh, we, did, we did a project over a couple of years. Um, uh, we were doing this from about 2011 to 2013, partnered with uh, some colleagues from Oregon State University, Paul Jepson and Michael Guzzi, and they had created a tool called the Pesticide Risk Mitigation Engine or IPM Prime. And it was, uh, I'll explain what that is in a second, but they basically had the ability to translate pesticide use into risk scores. And so we wanted to take, we have our pesticide use database. We wanted to take 20 or so years of pesticide use data and lettuce and look at, have we really reduced risk? And so this was actually a small project. It was funded. It wasn't really a huge amount of money. It was quite a bit of work. Um, it was funded by an Arizona Specialty Crop Block Grant. So what is the IPM Prime? It's basically two things. It's an extensively peer-reviewed database of ecotoxicological risk indices. I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute, but it's based on the data that's submitted by pesticide registrants to EPA that shows the effects of pesticides on non-target organisms. That's the main thing it is. That's kind of the underlying uh, information in it. And they had also created an online tool for growers uh, where you could go in and you could do site specific things. You could put in your, this is our pesticide program and you could look at the risks that are there and you could mitigate them. You could make changes to lower the risk. Um, this is still available on a website um, that I have down there at the bottom. It's ipmprime.org if you wanna go have a look at it. The risk indices, that the registrants need to gather data on and submit to EPA when they, when they register their pesticides are shown here. So a number of different organisms uh, and they do lab studies to show um, what are the impacts of these chemicals you know, when, when these organisms are directly exposed to them. So there's all these risk indices in PRIME. And one of the interesting things about PRIME is it doesn't try to, uh, give you one risk score across all of those. You get a separate risk score for each index. So you can see that some chemistries might be harmful to birds, for example, but uh, not a problem for aquatic invertebrates or whatever. And so uh, it's a very robust system. And uh, I wanna explain how those risk scores are calculated. The risk scores are probabilistic. So IPM Prime is designed to connect critical doses and concentrations from those lab studies to adverse effects of pesticides observed in field studies by way of a st statistical model that predicts the potential for ecological injury from a pesticide treatment. So the risk that is calculated is based on both toxicity and potential for exposure. It has a field element to it as well as uh, the information from the lab. And the risk score Basically, it tells you the probability of an adverse effect. So here we're looking at the example of avian acute uh, risk index. And if we had a risk score of 0.2, that means we have a 20% chance of harming birds with that application. And what we did in our project was we, we further categorized the risk scores generated by Prime into low risk below 0.1, moderate risk between 0.1 and 0.5, and high risk, anything over 0.5 being high risk. We prepared the Arizona lettuce data from 1991 to 2011, and we analyzed it using the prime database, and we generated two main statistics I'm gonna to talk to you about. This is a very, very broad look at risk that I'm showing you here. We calculated a mean risk score across all active ingredients for each year Right? What's the average risk of 
everything we're doing in lettuce in 1991. And that means insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, everything we had in the database. So I'll be showing you those mean risk scores, because if we could show that uh, overall we're seeing a decline across everything we're applying, then we know that we're, you know, we're seeing a reduction in risk. A second thing I want to say is that we did this study in a, um, it has a um, spatial element to it. So we were examining data on the level of a section. Uh, if you know anything about how the, the land system is organized, we have townships, ranges, and sections. A section is about a square mile. So our calculations were done at that level. I'll present some spatial information where we were able to document uh, what we call impact acres. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. I'm gonna show you the results by risk index. So for each risk index, we'll look at a line that shows um, our change in risk over time, over those years, based on the mean scores. About 10% of our pesticide use data for lettuce uh, we, we weren't able to calculate uh, prime risk scores for one reason or another. Some of those were newer chemistries that weren't in the, uh, in, in the prime database that hadn't had uh, the EPA information available to us. Um, but about 20% of the time, those risk scores came up uh, so low, um, they're, they're effectively zero in terms of a potential adverse effect for, you know, for whatever organism we're talking about. And those, uh, those ones are included in the data I'm showing. The 10%, of course, are not. So you're gonna see a, a series of these charts here. Um, these are the risk scores going along the y-axis, and these are the years. And uh, starting with aquatic algae, I'm showing the mean risk of all active ingredients applied you know, for each year. Very low, and these will go up as we go through. There's avian acute. There's fish chronic, there's small mammal risk, inhalation, avian reproductive risk, earthworms, and aquatic invertebrates. So I wanna mention a couple things. Um, what about human risk? Well, human risk is reflected in the orange line that you see. Um, inhalation risk is one of the things that um, the registrants have to um, produce data on. And that inhalation risk, of course, is related to applicators who might be working with the chemicals. Um, but also, of course, uh, risk to mammals, uh, we're mammals, uh, is another line that might be very important to consider when we're thinking about potential human risk, right? Uh, I'm just changing the scale there. Um, so you can see, really, the highest mean risk never went over the 0.5 level when we average everything together. Um, and we do see very noticeable declines in many of these chemistries. And uh, so we felt this project kind of successfully showed overall we're, we're, reducing, we're reducing risk. We're gonna dive into the data a little bit more in a moment. Let me explain the second statistic, which is impact acres. Um, this is the proportion of an area that's impacted by a particular risk score. So this figure shows one section. It's about a square mile. Uh, of agricultural land. And if we were to calculate the risk score on a particular section, we'd be averaging all the chemicals that are there. And let's say that we, um, we calculated a very high risk score of uh, 0.92, but uh, really, you know, that risk score uh, was, ref was, was only applied on a small amount of a, a section. Uh, in other words, um, the 0.92 mean only applies to a portion of the section. This would most likely happen if a lot of the rest of this section wasn't agricultural land, probably. Um, but just for the sake of an example, we'll call that you know a little pink dot, meaning high risk, only applied to 10% of the section. Alternately, you might see another section where um, the risk score shown in the lighter green here was low. We only had a 0 0.07 mean risk score, but it, it applied when we averaged it across all the sections, uh, it applied to about 85% of the sections on average, you see? So we have these impact acres that we can uh, show you as bubbles where the size of the bubble is relative to the proportion of the acreage that was impacted by the risk. 
So uh, here's one example of that. I'm not gonna go through all of these charts with you, but I'll show you a couple quick examples. For avian reproductive, we have the scale up here, a, a circle this size impacted 50% of the section, right? And most of our bubbles are probably smaller than that size um, and, and pretty constant with, you know, some of them are a little smaller here. But overall, in a lot of our charts, what we saw was more of a trend where the bubbles were larger in the earlier years and you had the whatever level of risk impacting a smaller proportion of the section as we go on over time, which is interesting because lettuce production was increasing over this whole period. So we see that we're not only reducing the mean risk that we see, but that risk is really applicable to a smaller portion of the acres over time. So it's quite a phenomenal thing that we did see that reduction in risk, we're able to document it. Um, but, um, that's not really the whole story, is it? Uh, this chart shows um, the different risk indices now shown on the x-axis here. And each line represents a year in our study. And if you look at you know, the overall curves for all the data, we can see that, well, in 1991, we were way over here, somewhere close to 0.5. And over here, um, for this, this is aquatic invertebrates, and, and we're over here in 2011. So we've reduced that mean risk quite a bit, but you can see that there's a, there's a whole range of risk there. So even if our mean risk is low, we still have chemistries that are going out that are, that are toward this higher end of risk. And so we wanted to look at what chemistries are driving the risk that you know, remains in the system. And so we just did a quick take of one year, 2013, and we identified about 17 active ingredients out of, gosh, well over, uh, Gosh, um, I wish I had that number, but uh, we have, you know, thousands of active ingredients in the database. Uh, but let's just say in a given year, you know, we certainly have hundreds. Uh, so a small percentage are responsible for a high portion of the applications that are over that, uh, what we call a uh, high risk 0.5 factor. And uh, I'm not going to show you all those, but just to give you an idea, um, if any one of these risk indices went over 0.5, that's, that's what we're talking about. And some of these are pretty significant. And so we're able to hone in and say, well, why do we need that application? And do we, and are there any alternatives? So it helps us to think more carefully about what, what the growers are doing, why are they making those choices and to get more information about that and to drive our extension programs to see if we can bring that risk even lower, that risk that's coming from the pesticide choice. So for me, this project was a turning point because it's sort of helped me to think about, well, maybe this is something we should be teaching more and uh, integrating into our extension programs. And so a lot of my program focuses, even in our advanced systems, like in cotton, we're talking about those remaining applications that, that might be raising that risk a little bit higher and working with growers on that. So one example from our extension programs, um, this is just a two page extension publication it's put out uh, the, that was actually led by uh, one of Peter Ellsworth's graduate students, uh, Isadora Bordini, uh, put the team together to do this. And this is talking about knowing and balancing different risks in the cotton system. And it talks about the typical risks like, you know, well, you know, what's the risk of a chemical not working? Let's look at the efficacy. Um, let's look at the selectivity because those Non-selective things are killing our predators, and that's the risk. Um, but another risk that we introduced in this document was to look at the risk to human health and the environment. Where do we get information about that? It comes from EPA. It comes from the risk assessments that they do at EPA. And so um, in this, in this two-pager, if we flip it over, these are the recommendations to the growers. And I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but I'll just say green means fully selective. It's not going to harm any of the predators. Yellow is partially selective. It'll preserve some predators, may be harmful to others. Red, again, is broad spectrum. And we have introduced here, you know, the growers are interested in, well, what's most effective for, uh, for white fly? Oops, let me go back, sorry about that. What's most effective for white fly or ligus? Those are our two key pests in the system. We have one pest called brown stink bug. None of this stuff works. 
Um, that's kind of a problem. Even the broad spectrums don't work very well. We've convinced growers not to spray for it because we've shown that when they do spray for it, um, they knock out the predators and then they got to spray more for these other pests. And that was a study done by another graduate student a couple of years ago. Um, but what I want to show about this document is that we've integrated risk to aquatic life, wildlife, pollinators, and inhalation risk from EPA data. So that when growers are making their decisions, they can consider all these factors together. It's part of our program now. The very last part of my uh, talk, and it's gonna be pretty brief, uh, is to talk about how we're sort of working the other side of the equation. You know, On the one hand, we're working with growers um, to try to reduce the amount of risk that they're, uh, they're exposed to, uh, but uh, we also want to inform policy, uh, pesticide policy, with good information. And EPA's job is to basically ensure there's no unreasonable risk of adverse effects to human health and the environment. And they do that, they figure that out by doing these very detailed risk assessments. They're science-based and uh, they do modeling that's based on uh, certain assumptions of what chemicals are used and how much they're used. And then Based on those models, they say, well, these are the risks that are posed to all those different categories I've already talked about. And our goal at the Arizona Pest Management Center with respect to this is to inform their risk models with realistic estimates of exposure because we have the data. We have the pesticide use data with the cotton pest losses data. We can tell them exactly how much of a chemical we're using and what rates. We can talk to the growers. We can find out why it's important and we do all of that stuff. So we're conveying our science-based data to this agency that's charged with protecting public health. That's their first mandate. Well, also they do consider the economic benefits of pesticides, but not at the expense of human health. They will always try to mitigate that risk. I'm not gonna go into this, but EPA has a whole timeline of their, um, their registration reviews. I don't wanna go over, but uh, basically there's two points at which we will comment uh, they open it up and they say, we publish these risk assessments. Anyone in the public can look at them and can comment. We at that point will submit data uh, on what we're doing in Arizona and sometimes also including the surrounding states and um, we'll explain why it's important. And then when they get to the next stage, um, the proposed interim decision, that's where they're making label changes or proposed label changes. And they let people comment again and we may comment again. But when this next document comes out, if we commented here, they're going to, um, if, if our comments were useful, they're gonna cite our comments and they're gonna say, well, this information from the Arizona Pest Management Center said X. And so based on that, we integrated that into our decision-making process. And sometimes they may even say, we made a different, you know, a different conclusion because of it. Um, so uh, in addition to the data sources I've ta already talked about, we also, I, I have great relationships with our pest control advisors. I get them on the phone. I say, look, you know, you look at beets. We don't have a lot of beets in Arizona, but you know, this chemical it has some serious risks they're looking at. Do we really need this chemical? Are there alternatives? How do you use it? How much, you know, how much do you spray? All that kind of stuff. And then I provide that information in these comments that we put together. We've actually put together and submitted more than 70 comments since 2006 to EPA on different uh, chemical reviews. Those are available on our website. And um, so we wanted to ask the question, are our comments making any difference? And um, I was fortunate in 2019 to work with a, um, I had a summer intern, she's actually a, a high school uh, senior and uh, got her into this and she was able to help me with an evaluation of those comments. So um, we looked at 30 comments submitted to EPA from the Arizona Pest Management Center from 2012 to 2018. Um, and we examined those EPA documents to see, are, you know, are they using our information? Are they citing us? Are we making any difference? And uh, what we found was, mostly pretty encouraging, we actually found that about 67% of the time, EPA was considering our comments in one way or another. And um, in the purple slice here, about 17% of the time I was, uh, EPA provided enough of a paper trail, enough detail in their information to say that, you know, this bit of information from Arizona about the use pattern caused us to make this decision where we're actually gonna, uh, we're gonna, uh, 
we're going to have a reentry interval that's a little bit longer in this crop than we would have otherwise, because uh, now we know that the uh, you know the exposures aren't as bad as what we thought. We basically revised our risk model based on the information. So there are times where giving them you know the more realistic picture of what what's happening in the field with some of these crops causes them to make a decision that in, in a sense is it's favorable to the growers continue to use the crops, but it can go the other way as well because they're gonna to continue to protect human health. And if I had more time, I'd go through even more specific examples of that uh, where we comment at one point and you know, influence it and then we comment at another point and it influences it again. So I think this is actually a very conservative estimate of um, how influential our comments have been. When I first came to Arizona, Boy, those, the growers, the pest control advisors, they don't like EPA at all. They hate EPA. They, they say, all they're doing is taking our tools away, you know? Well, we've been, I've been working with them for years and they don't feel that way anymore. Um, a survey I conducted, this was from December, 2019 and January, 2020, when we still had face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, we had a series of extension meetings and I did a survey and out of that found that 45% uh, this audience is growers and pest control advisors, 45% said they strongly agree that, that their comments can influence the outcomes of these pesticide reviews, and 41% somewhat agreed. So, you know, about 86% of people are saying, you know, it's good to be engaged in the public policy dialogue when it comes to pesticides. So, um, I hope I'm on time. I'm kind of uh, wrapping up here. I know I went through some of that stuff pretty rapidly. I'd really be glad to take some questions. I want to thank Madison Hampton. She's the student that worked with me on that EPA evaluation and only had her for about eight weeks and uh, was really phenomenal. I had decided I'm going to work with more students. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the pandemic hit us, so I didn't have that opportunity this past year. But um, also, I want to thank my, my lab members, uh, Wayne and Alexa Brown, who do so much work on the pesticide use database. Uh, Peter Ellsworth is, uh, is largely responsible for pioneering that uh, crop pest losses survey um, and uh, worked a lot with him over the years uh, on that. So, um, and then, of course, a lot of funding agencies. This is a photo from November. And uh, in the background, you can see, you might be able to make out there's some antennae up on this hill. This is a South Mountain and it's the largest, it's the largest city park in the country because it's basically a mountain range. And our house is right behind this hill, a little neighborhood right behind this hill. That's where we live. And with that, I will wrap it up and take any questions. Thanks Al, that was great. Lots of really good information. We do have a couple of questions. Um, but before we get to that, I, I just look at that uh, landscape that you're showing there. And Arizona produces a lot of things, a lot of uh, produce, but I noticed they don't produce a lot of water. Are you guys worried about having to rely on water that's coming into the state uh, uh, from someplace else that you don't have control of? Yeah, uh, it's a huge, huge issue, Tim, and it ha you know, um, it's a complicated issue too, right? There's there's historical water rights. We have a lot of tribal lands, and uh, the tribes have uh, rights to water that you know are kind of irrevocable. Um, and um, and then of course you have competing interests in Arizona, California, Nevada, you know, the different states. Uh, that are that are all on that same uh, water system. So um, that's something that I don't go too deeply into in my work, but I can tell you that in recent, in about the last year or two, it's, it's really, a uh, shortage of water has really started to impact the central Arizona where more of the field crops are grown. And um, people are starting to look, growers are starting to look at some different choices. We have a, we have a crop called Waiuli, it's actually a native desert plant and it's an alternative source of rubber and um, that's something that has been looked at. USDA has done a lot of work on it over the last maybe 20 plus years um, but um, we, this company called Bridgestone that produces tires and uh, and they work with it so that's something that's kind of taking off in part because of the lack of water uh, where uh, otherwise I would say alfalfa and cotton are uh, 
as well as you know sorghum are some of the major field crops that are grown in the central part of the state. Okay, thanks. Um, Al, I've got a, a question I'm looking at here from Doug Richmond. I'll just read it. Uh, do you ever get pushback from industry, uh, uh, meaning growers and chemical producers and distributors and so forth, based on EPA's use of your data? And if so, could you elaborate a bit? Thanks, Doug. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you're out there. I don't see who's out there, so hello. Um, that's a, that's a great question. And I would say that uh, in my own personal experience, we really don't, um, at least not yet, because um, it's been a slow process, I think, uh, changing people's minds from you know, EPA as adversary. And I'm not saying we've changed everybody's minds, but anytime I go out and talk about this, I'm showing how our data made a difference in helping to you know, preserve a use or to implement a mitigation that maybe was less burdensome than it would have been without our data, right? So they're seeing quite the opposite. I mean, I think the growers I interact with are seeing a difference. Now you asked about industry. Um, we have really good relationships with, with industry on these issues. And, you know, they, they sponsor a lot of the meetings where, you know, there's fewer and fewer of these companies now, as you know, but, you know, we, we work with them. Uh, we even, um, partner sometimes with them in grants. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I think it's important to maintain those relationships. And I think mostly those companies appreciate it because usually the net outcome is being able to maybe preserve a use in a crop or uh, maybe preserve a higher rate sometimes because nine, nine times out of 10, our data are telling EPA that um, our use pattern is lower than their models assumed initially, if that makes sense. Do you have a uh, risk curve for pollinators and uh, what does that look like, especially uh, kind of over time? Oh, I wish I could answer that question, Tim. Well, the, the pollinator risk is something that EPA has, has started to look at very closely over the last several years. At the time we did our study, um, that risk index for pollinators was just starting to come about and it wasn't really well um, formulated enough. So it wasn't part of our uh, lettuce study that we did, but we are in the process of um, trying to put together uh, a similar project in cotton where we would be looking specifically at that information for not only pollinators, but also for uh, predators and beneficial insects. So I, I don't really know, um, what that looks like. But I'll tell you, the picture is not as simple as the media would suggest. So for example, I showed in some of my curves how important neonicotinoids were when they were first introduced in helping us to reduce uh, broad spectrum insecticide use. But um, you know, as you know, and as you've heard, neonicotinoids are often associated with pollinator risk. And in fact, they are, but there's four, is there four or five different neonicotinoids? There's, there's four main ones we use in Arizona. And when we look at the EPA risk assessments for those, they are not all the same color. I mean, some are more impactful on uh, pollinators than others based on EPA's risk studies. And so one of the points I would like to say is that um, you've got to look at the sense, you've got to look at the details of it. So if we were going to look at that, we, uh, that impact of neonicotinoids, we should look at it by active ingredient and see what's going on. And that should inform also the registration decisions that are made. We need to protect those pollinators. There's no doubt about it, but let's look at the science is what I'm saying. Great. Here's another question from Ashley Leach. Uh, and she asks if these data um, uh, and the, the model that's uh, uh, associated with them uh, influences the use of uh, non-chemical approaches in, in managing pests. And, and by that, I think she's talking about biological control and uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, I, um, I would maybe someday uh, come back or maybe you should invite Peter Ellsworth to come and give a seminar about cotton IPM because, uh, you know, the answer is yes, but it also varies by crop. Um, because of the advancements in pesticides with, with more and more uh, reduced risk uh, 
fully selective types of materials being available. Um, cotton is like our, our, our greatest example of a crop where we have excellent biological control. I, I hope I'm answering the, the question uh, that you asked, but um, I guess I would say that having the data and information about the pesticide use um, helps us to see like what proportion, because we know the risk factors, it helps to see what proportion of the applications might be uh, harming biological control. And um, that's something that um, the graduate student I mentioned, Isadora Bordini, who's working with Peter Ellsworth, she's examining very closely those uh, relationships between selective insecticide use and uh, predator populations. Great. Uh, Al, I think we're going to stop the uh, formal part of the seminar right now. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, Al has agreed to stay on. Uh, I've got two or three other questions yet. If you'd like to submit more questions on the Q&A, uh, we'll get those to, to Al and uh, have him uh, dive into those. But again, thanks for everyone attending. And uh, Al, thanks. Uh, that was a, a lot of information. Great stuff. It, almost makes me want to start writing another grant tomorrow. <laughs> yep, you write on the board and then we'll, we'll get it done. <laughs> You've been there before. Al, um, Linda Mason asked this question and it's a, it's a good one. Do you also work with migrant labor and do uh, uh, education type programs with them? I, I don't personally, um, but we definitely uh, have that in Arizona. I would say that um, one of our, one of the main ways we do that is through the pesticide safety education program. And we have a, a new, uh, it's actually a person that's been hired in the entomology department to do that. She's, been, she's only been on for about a year in U, in U of A, but she worked before that with the Arizona Department of Agriculture in pesticide safety and worker protection. And so she's been a phenomenal force, I think, in reaching that target audience on those topics. Uh, my major target audience, I would say, um, for my program in agriculture is the, is the pest control advisors. And, um, you know, they're licensed professionals, uh, you know, highly educated that work with the growers and through distributor companies, but also many of them are independents. And uh, they're the ones that are going to make decisions to adopt or not adopt an IPM practice. It's very rarely the growers themselves that make those decisions in Arizona. Great. Thanks. You remember uh, Gary Bennett? Sure. Gary Bennett is, is still kicking. Uh, he asked this question. Uh, do you work with uh, urban pest management and uh, uh, work with there? Obviously, they have pesticide issues uh, just like agriculture. Well, I do. And, you know, maybe the correct answer is not enough, Gary. Um, but um, my role uh, when I first came and still is, uh, it, it, I was hired into this role um, as you know, what they called IPM program manager for the University of Ar for the Arizona Pest Management Center. And initially I wasn't affiliated with the department. I, I joined officially in the entomology department later, but um, part of my role there is to work with all of our IPM programs. I'm in the process of coordinating with several teams. We have specific teams focused on, uh, we have a team that's focused on community IPM, which includes school IPM, it includes turf and ornamentals, and it includes uh, public health IPM. Uh, and uh, uh, Shujen Lee, who you guys uh, know and remember very well, she leads that public health IPM uh, program. And you should, you should have her back. Uh, uh, if you want to talk on, uh, especially some of the work she's been doing with the tribal populations. But um, as far as the urban team, uh, a lot of the work that I've done evaluation work on has been still on the IPM and schools part of it. Uh, I have had some involvement also on the turf uh, side. Uh, there's a couple of evaluations that have been done there. Um, it's mostly a matter of balancing my time, and it's also partly a matter of where the money is, one of, in terms of pursuing grant opportunities, right? And one of the limitations is that we don't have the pesticide use data on the urban side. And so when it comes to having data 
that we can sort of translate into pesticide use, pesticide risk, uh, that's only available to us in Arizona on the, on the agricultural side. And that's why kind of why I, I wanted to highlight that work today. But I do work closely with those teams and help them develop methods to evaluate their programs. Great. Thank you. Cliff Sadoff asks, does the public accept the valuation of the risk by the EPA or your risk indices? And if not, how do you address those concerns? Yeah. Hi, Cliff. How are you? It's a, it's a great question. Um, communicating with the public is a challenging thing uh, right now. And, you know, people are getting information from different sources and some less reliable than others. People do have concerns. You know, I talked to my, um, you know, I talked to my neighbor about glyphosate and things like that. Um, the general public isn't, isn't really a broad audience of my, for my programs in a way, but um, we have talked, you know, at the Arizona Pest Management Center, we've, we've talked and we've tried to develop a better outreach message, you know, for the public and uh, try to coordinate a better message about risk. Um, it really depends on who the audience is. I'll tell you, one of the really disappointing things to me about the, uh, the lettuce data that I shared with you guys and the reduction of risk there was that we had an advisory committee of uh, pest control advisors and growers, and um, they didn't even want to hear the word risk and the word lettuce in the same sentence, even if we were saying, look how much we've reduced the risk, it actually was a deal breaker for them. Uh, so the words you choose, the way you present information and whether or not someone accepts it in the public, those are really challenging areas. I wish I had more answers to it. Okay, thanks, Elle. Uh, Jan and Beckerman, she's uh, uh, across campus a little bit, but she still stirs up some trouble here. And uh, uh, here's her question. Uh, when working with growers, particularly organic growers, or the general public, how do you distinguish between risk and perception of risk? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I've started to look at this um, in my program where my target audience is more the people that might be applying the pesticides or you know, uh, making the decisions about the pesticides. We're starting to talk about pesticide risk communication. Uh, and there's some good experts in this field. And um, in fact, one of the first things I looked at actually came out of Purdue. Um, um, you know, I remember working with Fred Whitford over there in his pesticide program. And I wish I could remember the exact reference, but he has a really excellent publication on communicating risk to the public. And um, there's a researcher in England, um, I'm gonna blank out on her name, but I will look it up if there's a moment to do that, um, who has done great work in uh, communicating risk. And so what you find out is that people respond emotionally. They don't respond necessarily to scientific fact. And so finding a way to connect with your target audience, to, to find some kind of a human connection, uh, to, be, to, to be sympathetic and understanding of how they might feel, even if the risk their perceived risk isn't in line with, you know, like the, what the science would say about a particular chemistry. I think glyphosate is a good example of that. Um, you could, uh, you got to meet them where they are. You got to respect them as people and you got to, you know, uh, try to address their concerns. You know, I'm not saying I'm good at this. I'm saying I'm just starting to try to get a handle on this. Good enough. Uh, during your presentation about uh, cotton, you listed some pests. Uh, brown stink bug was one of those uh, in, in which you said we have sort of slacked off even spraying for those because of the, the uh, ripple effects and the ramifications it causes on, on uh, natural uh, predators and so forth. Uh, is Arizona have um, brown, marmorated, brown marmorated stink bug? We're kind of inundated with that rascal here. Uh, is that affecting uh, crops? Is that uh, uh, one of the things that you're looking at there? No, not yet. Not yet. I mean, we've talked about it and you know, I know it's been an issue for years for you guys and for others, but it hasn't become a problem for us uh, in, in agriculture. I think there, there, there have been some isolated detections you know, where it's coming in on a trailer and things like that. 
I might be a little behind the times, but I, I certainly haven't heard of it becoming a major issue either in urban or uh, agriculture here. But yeah, the, the stink bug I was talking about, we call the brown stink bug, is actually a native species that had not had an outbreak in Arizona cotton since something like 1963. Mm -hmm. And it came back with a vengeance around 2011, I think it was. And growers were just, they had, they had no idea. And, and the thing is nothing was working. Um, and still, um, um, I mean, we didn't even get like a special local needs or find some other solution to it. But um, we, we did have a graduate student that documented very clearly and showed the impact of growers who sprayed for it versus those who didn't and the economic outcomes of that. The growers who decided not to spray for it did better. Great. Well, things get really boring. We'll send you a couple of packages of <laughs> interesting questions. Al, uh, one more question. Um, when you looked at uh, the, uh, the effects of uh, pesticides on different organisms and you, you isolated uh, earthworms as, as one and uh, certainly the aquatic insects as a group are probably as, as uh, sensitive as any group. Um, but then uh, with the uh, earthworms, there are a lot of uh, soil dwelling uh, arthropods. Mm -hmm. Have you looked uh, or has anybody that you know of uh, been looking at uh, how these uh, insecticides affect that group of, of insects, the ones that live in the soil? Yeah, it's an excellent point. And I should have said that, but the, what we call the earthworm index accounts for a lot of other uh, a lot of other life, as you say, that's in the soil. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a neonicotinoid insecticide. It's one of the early ones that's really important in our lettuce production system. It's called imidacloprid. And boy, it's really hot on, uh, on those soil organisms. And uh, I wish we could get away from it more. Um, and, and that's, something that, you know, we've at least highlighted, you know, that, that issue. Um, but the imidacloprid often goes on as a soil application under most of the lettuce, at least, you know, for half of the year where it's grown, they will put that on under just about every acre. You can't find any worms in that Yuma soil uh, or, you know, so I don't know, that's a problem. You're absolutely right. Um, so even in a system where, you know, We've reduced a lot of the risk. We still we still have that. I don't know. Did I answer? Is anyone looking at it? You asked. I don't know. You know, we used to have a soil scientist in extension, and we haven't had one for years, if you can believe that. Um, um, it's one of those hires that should have been made. You know, as soon as the position was vacant. So we don't really, amazingly, we don't have a position of a researcher that should be working on that kind of stuff here. Sad. Okay, thanks. One more question, if, if I may. Uh, in extension, we uh, have to look at impacts as well. And uh, typically, we have sent out uh, surveys. Obviously, extension deals with people a lot. We send out surveys and say, what do you think of this? And, and uh, even questions delving into pesticide use, how much pesticide have you used, and so forth. But uh, the real impact uh, of what we do as extension specialists uh, deals with changing behaviors of, of people. And so the, the real question is, okay, you change pesticide, therefore what? And then uh, if we could get some more information on what the ultimate impacts of uh, what we do as extension educators uh, is if we can document that and show that as impact, because really that's the impact that we're looking to, to, to describe. Um, and I think that's the part that's going to be really valuable in extension is what we're, what kind of behaviors we're changing and therefore what happens, what kinds of uh, 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 benefits do we see because of that? Has, uh, you have any, uh, suggestions on what we could do outside just the the typical survey that begins with uh, how much did you like this speaker and uh, well yeah um so you're right and all those things are linked together like a chain right so the first 
the first component, and we, we often talk about short-term, medium-term, long-term impacts. The first link in that chain is, did anybody learn anything, you know, as a result of what we presented? And you can measure that. You can do a, you can, you can actually measure what they know pre and what they know post. You know, if you taught something in between, that's the best way to measure a change in knowledge, maybe. But, but um, what we're looking at is, is going from, did you learn something to therefore what? Did you right. No, something? I agree. The, the second step is then, did, was a behavior change because of something you learned? You want to try to link it back to that, right? right? So that you can take credit for it to show that so I didn't just change for no reason. I changed because I learned something, right? So as an example, um, if we talked about that brown stink bug and uh, how we were able to demonstrate, not, not me, our graduate student was able to demonstrate economically that it's, uh, it's not beneficial to spray for it. And we, we, we were able to do a survey uh, to show that, and well, and we have the, we have the pesticide data too. So, and we know what chemicals are used. So we can also show that pe the sprays for it drop down after that education program. But then we also ask, you know, um, whether uh, they would intend, if you first present that information, do you intend to change your behavior? You know, do you, do you think you will spray for brown stink bug in the future? That type of a question, right? And then you, you want to ideally follow up, right? A year later and look at the data. And if the only data you have is asking people if they sprayed, then that's fine. You go back and you say, well, did, did you spray for brown stink bug? You know, and if not, why not? Well, if it was influenced by your program, maybe they can, they can check a box there too, right? So linking the behavior to the knowledge change. And then that last step is then, well, if they don't spray, what was the economic benefit? And, and like the research that Lydia Brown was the name of the student that did that, the, the research that she did showed very specifically what the economic difference would be if you sprayed or didn't spray because the chances of having to then do follow-up sprays for white flies uh, or, or ligus, you know, uh, what would those cost? And, uh, you know, what would that cost you in yield, you know, and, and those kind of things. So being able to link it to economics or link it to an environmental impact or link it to a human health concern. That's what you, that's the chain, you know, knowledge, behavior, and then kind of the, what's the big, so what at the end. Well, listen, now that uh, was fantastic. Thanks so much. We, uh, I noted that we had more than uh, 50 people attending and uh, there's wow. still about 20 people uh, hanging on, still listening to uh, all of your answers. Uh, I know that you're going to be uh, talking with the graduate students here in a little bit, so we're going to to close down. But uh, again, uh, thanks so much for uh, for sharing. Uh, is it okay with you if we put your uh, email address out there? There's a couple of questions. Someone asked a, about a, a reference that you made that maybe you could share with them. Is is that all right? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I would just uh, encourage you again, you know, if you want to learn more about Arizona, uh, either agricultural or the urban side, I'd be, I'd be very happy to uh, suggest some other speakers that I think would be glad to, glad to present to the group in the future. Well, I just looked out the window and I think we should change that model. I'll come down to Arizona. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> might be the best way to do that, but we'll certainly uh, uh, consider that. Thanks again, and uh, on behalf of the, the department, everybody that was listening, uh, great job. Thanks again for, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it.